Hey guys, welcome back. I'm here with Ron, who is one of our embedded instructors. And today we're going to be going over picking a micro. Uh, we have some background videos for the micro platform we're going to be using. But today, Ron and I are going to be talking about some of the considerations from the embedded standpoint of what we should be looking at. I've kind of gone over some of the hardware stuff and the cost associated. And that's actually what's brought us to the point of looking at the STM32F0 line. So uh, Ryan and I today are going to talk a little bit more about what we should be looking for on the internals to the part and make sure we have everything we need to build out this small, uh, the small prototype, which will then go into a larger robot platform. So Ron. Uh, Hi, yep. Chris. How you doing? Good to see you again. <laughs> and yourself? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, we're talking about the F030. Let me just uh, pull up the page here real quick. I think this will work. So here's the, uh, here's the series we're talking about. Um, you have looked at this. Obviously, we've been going over some of this stuff. Can you talk a little bit of background on the uh, nuclear board you've been working with? Okay. Um, well, the nuclear board that we've got. Oh, I don't know if you can see it. There we go. The nuclear board that we've got is um, it's supposed to be kind of like a low power, sorry, low end cost processor. Mm -hmm. And so, really, we're just kind of trying to find something that kind of meets everything that we need for our new project. Uh, if you can kind of see it there. There we go. Yeah, yep. there we go. yeah, so it's got that. those Arduino breakout pins. It's like a $10 development board. It's got the F030 yeah. on it, right, and the R8. It's got, yeah. got built-in debugger. It's got pretty much everything you could do in Arduino, but with the flexibility of us being able to kind of write our own code directly to it without any limitations, really. Right, right, and we've been writing it. In, I mean, so you, you and Eric, our other embedded instructor, have been doing stuff in C, actually using yeah. uh, Eclipse, stuff like that. So that's just background for people that might not have seen this stuff yeah. before. So we've kind of been going through the whole process of setting up a development environment, uh, teaching kind of things like all oh, the low-level setups that you may need for the processor. Um, we're kind of going through the whole thing of what you need to do if you want to debug, and, you know, that sort of stuff. Right. Uh, kind of little things that you wouldn't normally want to do with the Arduino because you're kind of trying to kind of get into your project where we're actually trying to kind of take a step back and actually, okay, so what if we're actually trying to make a big project and we get to an issue where we're stuck in a code, what do we do then? Yep, so. exactly, exactly. Yeah, and so talking about going forwards, so the uh, the board I'm talking about, we're actually calling one uh, central control, right? And that is a, uh, that's kind of the brains of this little robot project we're doing, uh, which is in pieces on my bench right now, so I <laughs> can't show it to people. But uh, it's uh, basically, it's going to be talking out to other modules, right? And then eventually the idea is kind of federating this micro onto the other modules themselves. So if you imagine the wheel having a motor driver, a motor encoder, a micro on board, and then we'll just pass it power and a single communication line, and then hopefully that is enough to talk to a wheel. And then everything yeah. is kind of on it, kind of operating on its own. Kind of split, split up, modulize, easy to kind of develop kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, and then making it extensible as well. Uh, and then so, that, so the idea behind that was having less than a dollar in a thousand quantities, picking a part that's less than a dollar. Uh, that's kind of dicey, actually, trying to get to that point. I don't think we're actually going to hit that mark. It it's going to really depend on this conversation of, you know, how much stuff do we actually need in here? Yeah, because so, to be honest, though, if we if we make it too generic, mm -hmm. that one dollar target is going to be long gone, if that makes sense. So right, right. Let's just kind of try and find what we actually need and cut it down, if that makes sense. So, I th yeah, I think so. And I think that you know, it is often. Um, you can you can have that balance, right? If we if we said, oh well, the hardware has to be if the the micro itself has to be less than a dollar. When you really think about it, if you're really resource constrained then on the micro, then the amount of time you end up writing code to optimize and get the smaller and smaller code base in there, it gets kind of difficult actually, and that might end up costing you more in the long run. Right. So let's take a look over at this again. Uh, I just wanted to show this chart here because this is actually what messed me up, but uh, maybe we could talk about this a little bit. Um, so one thing is, so we were looking initially at, like, like uh, Ron said, with the Nucleo, it's the F030. So that's the one that's on board there. Uh, I think it has 32K of flash. I'm not sure what the flash was on there. But it's the 4, four kilobyte of RAM is the, the 0, 3, the 3, see how the X is here? Um, yeah. Make that a little bigger. Um, the X here is uh, the, the amount of RAM on board. So 3 is... The, four, the, the three zero is the four kilobytes, uh, five zero is the, the eight kilobytes, and everything else. So, um, and so basically, though, it kind of shows that 
none of this stuff up here, if we wanted touch sense, if we wanted the DAC, if we wanted the comparator, you know, no. all we're going to get is the, I think it's what, like one, one I squared C, one spy, one I two S, and then an eighty two two UARDs. Two, only, only two. Okay. Yeah. with well, this one, okay. I mean, I've, I've looked at the actual data sheet for this one. So this one, it's got two. Mm -hmm. Um, but we are on the value line, so it's the lowest you're going to get. Right. And I, I guess, oh, yeah, there's this stuff on the left here, too. So it is cor Cortex M0, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, so I guess that what it comes down to is, you know, we haven't yet decided how we're going to be talking all these boards. But one thing that you have experience with is is the uh, is CAN. CAN in space. Right. So uh, can you explain CAN real quick? OK. Um... The basic fundamental of it is, is just that it's a node-based system. So it, in a very simple uh, two-wire interface, uh, if you ignore power and ground, mm -hmm. uh, you can connect many devices together using the same protocol. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a lot like IRS 405, mm -hmm. um, where you can kind of just connect it all together and it's a differential line. Um, but the advantage of it, though, is that it's got built-in um, error detection so, and it's got built-in features such as retrying the message. So uh, very easily you can put together a, a set of CAN messages you want to transmit, broadcast, I guess you can say, um, to more than one device. And then without having to actually check to see if the data has been received and having to kind of check to see if the data is correct, anything like that, you've, you you could very easily can actually connect multiple devices. So, gotcha. um, I mean, one of the main advantages of, say, uh, UART uh, is the fact that you don't have to worry too much about actually sharing the same ground lines. So potentially you can actually have oh. uh, more than one node connected in many, in, in certain very long distance. Just because of because the potential differences, stuff like that. Exactly, huh. exactly. So I mean, it's meant to be more for the robust sort of um, environment where it's going to be quite noisy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so... What's the comparison yeah. with like I squared C? I mean, so I squared C is, is two line normally. Um, so, well, I mean, well, you need ground as well, right? And, and you also need power as well with that I2C. Mm, okay, okay. Because, because you've got um, pull-up resistors on that as well. So they actually need to share the same, um, well, they don't need to share the same supply, but they need to actually be able to withstand the same voltage levels. Gotcha. Um, I mean, a good I2C, or well, a device that actually meets the I2C standard mm -hmm. should be tolerable to 5 volts. Um, okay. But that's the key, but that's the one of the issues with it, though, is that you're stuck working with the same voltage between devices. Right, so on um, a smaller scale, like we're, I mean, we're on within a very small area. So for that kind of thing, it might be an okay fit, but. Yeah. Okay. And also it's not differential. So if you're gonna try and transmit anything greater than two meters, uh -huh. then you're gonna have to make sure that you actually do extra stuff to, to condition those signals where right. with CAN naturally you can just like lend yourself to distances. Yep. Um, but one thing though is with, with AskQuest C, you get about 128 different IDs where with uh, CAN, you're looking about, well, it depends whether you're doing the kind of the basic version of it. Mm -hmm. I think it's like uh, at least I think a, a thousand odd IDs. I mean, I, I can't remember top of my Sounds like both might be more than we need, but yeah. 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 OK, OK, cool. Well, let's let's take a look real quick at, I just want to take a look at some of these um, these other things as well, because you know I was, I was looking at these uh, different lines. Oop, that's a little big. Um, and so just trying to really, you know, one of the things that was difficult for me was trying to was trying to decode uh, kind of flash the, size and yeah, flash size but also just, you know, what do these part numbers even mean? That's that's always a big source of confusion for me. This chart kind of helped because I realized that like why are there two in the 32k column here? Uh, or no, not even that one. 16k yeah, see, even this stuff. <laughs> uh, no, I think it was this one here. Yeah, so like you see how there's 31 E6, 31 G6, and 31 F6. Like what the heck is the difference there? And the difference is actually the package size, right? And that, right. that's what I was looking at and trying to break out, okay, well, how do I, how do I determine which one's going to be a good fit for me here? And then also trying to compare that against prices because prices was obviously something that we were looking at as well. Um, and you know, there's a selector table down here, so that that definitely helps a little bit. So what I was looking at was the, I think it was, the this one here, the F31C6. Okay. Go to that one real quick. Um, just because, you know, the pinouts and the, 
just trying to figure out what the heck I actually, what, what we need from the hardware side, right? So I mean, like, if you look at this part, there's actually not, you don't need too much externally. But what I started to get into then, and what I wanted to ask you about is kind of, is there anything, it's kind of a broad question, but is there anything missing here that we would have expected? Um, I just noticed this a really nice thing with this one, mm -hmm. uh, VBAT, uh, VBAT mm -hmm. supply for their real time clock. Mm. That might actually be quite kind of a nice thing for us to have for the robot. Um, being able, being afraid to have his, his own um, uh, real time clock. Oh, just so uh, it can of, go to sleep and wake up at certain interval kind of things. That, but uh, more importantly, I was actually hoping to get into data logging, which is something that's that's quite common to do in the industry. Oh, uh, yeah. Whenever you want to quickly do a data something, I don't know if you want to do S Square C data logging or you want to read some sensor. It actually pays to have something that can, you can actually match against a, a particular time yeah yeah so i'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not talking like you kind of put it through and you sample as many you take as many samples as accurately set sorry you don't i'm not sort of talking about trying to sample as as accurate as often as possible i'm thinking more like put the device to sleep wake up in about a day's time and see okay was that sensor all right kind of right thing. right yeah no that and that's that's actually really nice for that kind of stuff i guess the other thing i was wondering about is so the other thing we're looking at here I go back to the, this first page, is kind of like looking at what we're missing out on. And that's why I asked about the can as well, because what I didn't realize looking at this chart is that this actually will not, it's not guaranteed. It's not like every part that has 0x1 will have that part. You actually have to go to the top of the line, the 256 flash. Oh, so this is more like an, a summary of what you can expect from this particular line. Exactly. Yeah, this is the max number of view arts. This is the, you know, this is the possibility of getting up to two, right? everything is up to, and that's kind of the, that was what really tripped me up when I was looking at this stuff. And so what I was really wondering though, is from your perspective, I mean, do you see any of these features that we would need that would mandate even going to this line in the first place? Because really, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like there's too much of a difference, you know, there's some voltage differences, but between the F30 and the F31. I mean, to be honest, like, uh, I know you were mentioning about CAN, um, I'm perfectly happy to do without it because we can get uh, I squared C to can um, devices. So if we do need to experiment and or want to show anything, we can always just get something like that. Oh, like a transceiver um, chip, you're saying? Well, no, no. I'm actually talking about uh, the full stack. Uh, so it's, it's actually a chip that actually does convert I squared C commands to can. You still have to go ahead either okay. buy the ones that come with the transceiver, mm -hmm. or you have to do your own if that makes sense. Right, right. Okay. Um, but it just well, like it makes that, it makes that protocol kind of just a translator like it's don't even think about it kind of thing. Yeah, incidentally, I mean we can. I mean I have done this before with the uh, embeds, you know, the original embed device. Mm -hmm. You can actually use CAN without the transceiver. So if you actually want to save yourself that cost, it's mm -hmm. just you lose the differential, and right. it's only going to work from you know between two nodes rather than multiple devices. But right. Okay. Um, but the, the point is, I don't, I don't think we're going to be needing it, and as much as it's a nice feature. Yeah. Um, I, I'm concerned that it's going to be the cost of the transceiver that's going to hike it up further. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good point. Well, and that's kind of the that's kind of the decision point here. You know, the, what I wanted to, you know, these kind of calls that we're having here, I wanted to kind of replicate the the interface that would normally happen between a hardware person and a firmware person in a, in the product design team, right? Because what do we actually need? Are we willing to pay for it, or should we pay for it later? That kind of those kind of decisions. Yeah. So um, looking at the other things here, I mean, if as long as it has the so we have a spy, we have an I, I squared C, we have two UARTs. I mean, do you find that two UARTs is enough for this kind of application? I mean, we're kind of going modular, so it feels like we would have fewer UARTs. You know, we could just throw another micro at it if we needed another UART. That's that's kind of the thing I think. Yeah. Right. Well, the the thing I would tend to want to use, oh, to be honest, when I if I want to use my controller, I, I want to at least have two UARTs. One of them for whatever application I want to use, and the second one for debugging. Oh, um, okay. That's good to know. Because, because I know with the with the nuclear board, you can actually send um, data back uh, by the debugger, uh -huh. but you may not necessarily have that connected on the board, or you may not want to actually populate that on the final product. Right. And so having a dedicated, even if it's TTL, I mean, yeah, um, will actually help us greatly. Imagine if we got about five different uh, processors all hooked up on the same board, mm -hmm. and we're trying to figure out which is the one that's having issues. Just being able to just to click quickly uh, plug your FTDI cable to that and go, oh, okay, so this one's obviously working, so it's yeah. going to be that one we're going to have to debug. Yeah, oh, I see, I so, see. That's Yeah, that's sorry? actually really nice, right. And and even, it's almost like a real-time data logging, right? That's kind of what the serial plays that's as right, in that yeah. case, right? Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's that's a, that's a really good idea. Okay, so, uh, so then other things I think about, like, you know, 
DACs and comparators. Like for motors, that could actually really make some sense uh, for the comparator side of things. But, um, you know, there's some... This for motor control, is it all? What's that? Are you saying for motor control so we can actually get feedback? Yeah, or you... yeah. And, I mean, just for uh, capturing and actually... interrupts, stuff like that. Um, but we're not doing super fast. I mean, I'm, if uh, so people have seen the video, the, the encoder even is like, what, 30, 40 hertz. I mean, it's not anything yeah, yeah. super fancy. So, uh, okay. And, and so just, yeah, I mean, I, what I'm really trying to figure out is, you know, other things, other things that we need on this, uh, this sheet here, uh, you know, is, are there other, I mean, I guess we won't know about SRAM, how much we actually need an SRAM, stuff like that. Um, until no, later. but the, the nice thing though is we can always choose the lower end of the of the of the series of processors, and if we need run out of memory, we can always up or go up a level if that makes sense. Yeah, right. Yeah, that does. That does. Right, and then and then you're still designing for the low end, and then kind yeah. of increasing over time versus like I have as much memory as I want. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, that's actually actually a good question though. I, I, a good point actually is because um, hopefully when we write the code, we're going to try and write it all portable. Mm -hmm. And so, in theory, if we do it right, if we do decide to go for a different manufacturer altogether, I don't think it would take us long to actually move the code from one place to another. Right. So, uh, so yeah, and I, that would be I, that would be a good exercise, regardless, right? Just for like testing portability in the first place. Um, yeah. And 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 that's definitely something we'll look at into in the future. Um, you know, kind of. But yeah, having those that good that well written code in the first place will will enable that in the future for sure. Um, Thinking about other things like so, I the other things I was struggling with. I mean, obviously, being coming from the hardware side more, you know, looking at uh, what was it? Not interrupts. It was I was looking at the oh, so the pinouts stuff like that. Uh, oh, the pin mapping. That's one thing that I was really worried have about. You have you compared it with the with the other ones to kind of see if they were quite if they if if you can just drop them off, you know, just drop a placement or. Oh, oh, so you mean from going from one, so as long as you're in the same package, being able to go from one to the next? Yeah, because uh, on, on that particular table you got there, you got uh -huh. the value line, and you've also got the, the next level up. Uh -huh. So you're saying going from, like, if I can't yeah. get an F3030, can I use the F031 because that's, that's available it. in the marketplace? Yeah, because with the NXP devices, uh, mm -hmm. even though you're using the M0, like an LPC 1114, mm -hmm. you can quite easily go for the M3, which has the same pin-to-pin -pin compatibility. Ah, uh, that's very nice. I mean, it means you you end up losing some functionality. Like, for example, the like the LPC 11C14, mm -hmm. the CAN uh, pins uh -huh. also end up mapping for the CAN for the M3 version. Right. And so you not only have you got a completely different processor altogether and speed, but you've got that sort of, for, just imagine it really when if you if you're kind of like doing a product and you end up kind of going ah you know what we need a bit more power right so it, <laughs> I think you have to add captain after that um. <laughs> yeah <laughs> captain yeah yeah no 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 that's I mean, yeah I, I totally agree with that and and that kind of that that swappability is really important not even just from a you know being able to extend the ability of your parts but if you're going to get if you're trying to build something. And you, there, if you if you don't have the parts to build with, but there's yeah. a similar part in the distribution channel somewhere, sometimes you just need to switch it in, you know, for a couple of products or something. So having that kind there of thing is nice. There, there's actually one feature I would love to have on the processor, and I I'm just I'm just gonna put that as a wish list. Okay. And that's that's USB. I mean, I did I did just see on your table that on the base value they actually had USB. Yeah. Which is actually quite surprising that they that they actually. Are willing to put USB on such a low, such a low cost device. Yeah, but I think um, that might be the same thing where it's you know you have to get to the. Well, we can go and look. The, I mean, like. Oh no! I meant on the value line. They got one. For, they got one tick on there. Where? Oh. On top right. Yeah, you're right. Well, let's check that out. You, yeah, because um, if if we can have that right, look at this way. So there was one product I worked on a while ago, mm -hmm. and I actually wrote a USB uh, library for um, being able to reprogram the device by USB, so drag and drop files, so just like what they do with the embeds. Oh, interesting. Um, and one of the nice things about being able to do that is that you can give somebody the board, and because imagine you've got yourself five different processors running there any one time. Uh -huh. It'd be nice to just be able to plug in the USB device and just drag the file in, program, and off you go, just get started. Huh, interesting. So it's one of these parts here. Uh, so it's the, so we want the C6, I think. I hope it's a nice package. 
Yeah, that's the QFP 48. I would like to stay in QFP. The 64 and 48, I think that's all that's available. I don't think there's any BGAs on the bottom line. But I would actually wonder more about the uh, the cost, right? So this, if I grab I think it would be the same thing as CAN, really. Yeah, exactly. If it's going to be like super expensive, uh, F070, what was it? R, R, well, let's just say that, and then R. So, making sure it's actually available in. Uh, can we actually buy it too? Right, that's true. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, though, really because we're probably going to end up having some sort of bootloader, any bootloader anyway. So it's not it's not the end of the world. Uh huh. It just it just it's been so nice just to be able to plug something in and just drag the file in. Yeah. But. Yeah. So it looks like two bucks. So definitely would would up the cost. Um, yeah. Somewhat. Yeah, maybe not too bad. F zero C B. That's weird. Uh, yeah. So it looks like the ones that are actually big enough to have any pins coming out are a little bit. What about like the stack though? I mean, it's it, is it USB acting as serial or would it be, or would it be? Um, well, the one that I, I put together was a USB to mass storage. So it's just uh, the stack that's oh, on it oh, okay. acted as a, as a, as a hid device for a mass device. Gotcha. So, I, so it, it, it basically all it did is just ended up mapping the flash uh, space so that when you do actually drag a file in, it just ends up writing it straight through. So it's not. Oh, that's kind of nice, though. Yeah. I uh, mean, I don't think that'll be as big a deal for us because we're going to be doing, uh, you know, we'll be in the in the mode of, of reprogramming but I could see if we had five boards and needed five images then like five separate images that could be yeah kind of kind of dicey I wanted we to get back to the uh, the pinout real quick though too just to show okay. the the crossover I the alternate functions always wig me out and like just that I'm not going to actually be able to use like for this one right so if I wanted to use the UART UART TX UART UX or RX rather that means that two out of the however many ten ADC inputs there are are gone, right? And that's always the thing that's like, oh, I completely forgot that there's only so many pins here. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, you do find it that the when they give you alternative functions, it, they they will have actually also remap those pins to other places as well altogether. So uh, on the right hand side is their their primary function, isn't it? Their addition are the ones that you can't that is stuck is you know is uh, dedicated to that pin, and it's okay. ADCs. But on the left side here, you've got the um, alternative function, uh -huh. uh, the timer two, channel one. I bet if you look further down, you'll, you'll see it again. Like this? Like, just search for this? Say the UART1 CTS, because that's, that's, they'll definitely remap that somewhere else. Oops. So that's on pin. Ah, uh, OK. So yeah, these it's, so on, yeah, so on that first one, it's. So on the larger pin, pin count ones would have been the ones that they would have Swap it between pins. I so. see. Right, right, right. Yeah. So the yeah, because like the twenty pin here, the TSOP twenty is only going to have so many pins here. So you have to have make sure that some of the critical stuff's on there, and then all the pins start to go away here. So yeah, the bigger stuff actually can have multiple versions. Yeah, I mean you possibly can get away with it with some of the smaller ones, uh -huh. and it will probably be ice quest see if they're going to have if they actually to be honest, I lie. It's the U R that the ones that they're more likely to swap between pins. The ask C is that kind of like second next thing, if that makes sense. Is it because they're it's uh, hard silicon for the I squared C versus a serial uh, port? No, it's because people are more likely to use the type the UARTs than the ask C. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, because with ask C, you tend to kind of just want to use the one, and that one ends up connecting to multiple devices. Where with the UART, like I was saying to you about debugging, uh -huh. you might want to. It might become like a second choice people where they want to put that, uh -huh. and so they'll say, "Okay, we'll we'll lay out the accuracy, and then we'll just sacrifice the UART from whatever pins we want to use." That makes sense. I gotcha. Oh, so this is actually broken out a little bit more here as well. This is quite nice. Yeah. Okay. I, I have to say one thing that did catch me out with the data sheet, uh -huh. um, and it's exactly with the with the alternative functions. Um, the, the alternative functions, the description for the pins, are in a different set of data sheets than the ones that actually tells you how to configure the UARTs, that's to configure the, the pins. So you're saying so if, if I you want, wanted to go configure this right now, I'd have to go to a different data sheet? Yeah, so you have to, if you look at the registers that you have to configure, uh -huh. you have to go and look at a different data sheet, 
and then come back to this data sheet to find out which alternative function you want to enable. Is it like the user manual versus the data sheet type of thing? Like one is this. I mean, usually data sheet, I think of more of hardware type of thing, but yeah. Uh, and then the other one is like a programming guide or user manual, that kind of thing. But this does have True. other stuff in here as well. So. True. I mean, if you co if you have a look at um, NXP data sheets, mm -hmm. they basically tend to keep everything you need to know about that device into one data sheet. Uh huh. Is it more than one hundred thirteen pages? Though? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I think we'll. I, we should probably round up here. Um, All right. But this has been good. I mean, I think that we should continue talking about this stuff, especially. You know, like I said, we're right now we're talking about the central command board, uh, which is kind of going to be the brains of it. Uh, and then what the idea then is that we're going to then eventually replicate whatever chip is on there onto each subboard, and so trying to make a decision that's a good fit for the central board plus the the external boards. I think that uh, I think that we'll be able to get there, and hopefully this family of parts. Maybe, but maybe not. Maybe we get to the point where we're like, this just isn't going to do it. The cost is wrong. The the price is wrong. Everything. But then there's also the you know the tool chain considerations because we've already started down that path. But to be honest, the design is in lock, so we've got the flexibility to make the changes we, that we need to do. So right. Cool. Well, thanks for talking about this. We will be doing this again. Uh, once again, Ron is one of our embedded instructors, along with Eric. And uh, we'll be talking more about embedded and hardware and matching it all together in the future. Let's have fun next time. All right, see ya. See ya.